Okay, we're mm -hmm. going to start. Good evening, everyone. I will be introduced by Daria later, but uh, I would like to start by welcoming everyone at the Center for Urban History today. We'll be talking about uh, something very bureaucratic uh, in, I hope, a non-bureaucratic way. This will not be a lecture, so um, over the course of what's going to happen over the next 20 to 30 minutes, uh, please uh, collect yourselves, collect your thoughts that you brought with you, and uh, we would very much like this to be a conversation for all of us. So, you know, we're not um, at the podium, we have a uh, translation gone. So, um, if you're more comfortable, you can, uh, we do have headsets that you can turn, and which is why also we speak into the microphone. That's a note from me. Again, I'm very happy to see you all here, um, and especially, especially colleagues uh, here with me, with whom, or rather, with whom I am now. Okay, now we're going to switch to English, and um, I'm very proud, and this is like our second uh, uh, second uh, meeting together. The first was a uh, professional meeting for journalists and it was very exciting and actually it highlighted one of the uh, one of the lots of Natalie's uh, fields of expertise and now we're going to we're going to push you towards another one and I'm going to present our uh, our speakers Natalie Nebert who is a journalist I don't know, a wonderful intellectual, my dear friend, and uh, Nagali has been covering Europe and processes in Europe and the uh, European Union for many years. And for the next 20 something minutes, I think we will tackle some of the um, painful, non painful, but important points of the European Union and our visions of it. And together with Sophia Jack, whom I think you know perfectly well, uh, who is the, uh, the director of the Center for Open History in Central Eastern Europe. And we also are going to unfold what is the Central Eastern Europe. Please. So yeah. So, uh, and my name, me, my name is Daniel Bordion, I'm a journalist and an editor. Um, so I, what, where, when we were preparing this, this meeting and uh, been thinking about what, what are we going to, what are we going to discuss, so the, the main things are that, and maybe one of the, one, one, one of our presumptions is, is that in Ukraine, when we talk about Europe, we imagine many different things. We, have, we all have a different image of Europe. In Europe, there are different images of Europe, depending on the points of view, depending on where, where you live. I don't know. For Ukraine, for example, it's my opinion, some parts of Europe are more visible than the others. Paradoxically, we see, for example, Baltic more than we see Slovakia, who is our direct neighbor. This is a very interesting thing to think about, and I think we will we will dive more deeper into that. And uh, what is this Euro integration thing? What are we integrating into? And is this actually a one-way street? Maybe it could be a simultaneous two-way process. And how? we can learn from each other and actually from whom are we learning when we are speaking about European integration and so I want to, I want to uh, pass uh, the mic to Natalie and thank you very much um, thank you very much um, Yanejo for your Ukraine school but I'm learning <laughs> and I just want to say that um, uh, it's a big pleasure for me to be here and it's quite moving actually because I remember, I just remembered that last time I was here was in, uh, in 2019 and I remember with Dasha we were sitting in the courtyard, uh, it was October, it was nice weather and 
we had a long discussion about how young people in Ukraine uh, wanted to have more contacts and to have more attention from other Europeans, uh, cultural contacts, debates, uh, and that there was this feeling that uh, Ukraine was on the periphery somehow, and um, so there was this appetite for attention and contacts, exchanges, and now for, for many uh, tragic reasons and uh, historically important reasons that we know uh, Ukraine is in the middle, is not, not at all in the periphery, but very much in the middle of European, of Europe, I would say, and European attention, of course, and there are many uh, discussions happening, uh, and I think that will increasingly um, happen between Ukrainians, young Ukrainians, different Ukrainians, and uh, other Europeans. Um, and I, I welcome this. I think it's uh, the silver lining, the positive thing that's happening in the middle of uh, a tragedy, which is uh, Russia's war of aggression. Um, and um, I, I was thinking, um, I was thinking, what what could I share? Because I'm I'm somebody who has um, worked in different European countries. I'm French, but I grew up in England and then in Canada, and I lived in different European countries when I uh, became a journalist. I lived in uh, Czechoslovakia the last two years of Czechoslovakia until '93. And um, I lived in um, I lived in Kiev in the, the middle of the 90s, um, and right now I'm based in uh, Latvia, and traveling a little bit in the region. Um, and um, when I when I was a teenager, I was living in um, Alsace in the east of France. Uh, so this was I was in going to high school, and this was the, the middle of the 80s. Um, and I grew up in school, we, t we were taught that the European project was something almost sacred, that it was about reconciliation between France and Germany uh, after the disaster of the Second World War. We were able to come together and build this beautiful project and that we uh, should be friends. And I, when I was 16 years old, I went to live for several weeks in the region of Stuttgart, in a German family. Um, and uh, I, I remember I was playing chess with the young, the young girl uh, who was my exchange student, and she was always beating me at chess, and I, I, I was slightly irritated by this, so I didn't know if it was good for a Franco-German friendship, but <laughs> anyway. Um, and, uh, and I kept strong ties with uh, England, because um, my family had moved to England when I was a small child. And I, um, I went to Central and Eastern Europe uh, after 89, um, um, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. That was uh, um, decisive for my, my choices. So I, I became a, a, a European, I, f I became somebody who feels deeply European, uh, but uh, also aware that my European experience or European experiences is like a collection of different things. And I think we all have Europe personal European experiences which are a collection of things. Maybe it's some trips that you made to some other European country, maybe it's somebody you met, maybe it's some literature that you read or um, uh, music. Uh, and in fact, in a way, we are European without even knowing it, I think, you know. And, and you have, by the way, many people outside who live outside of Europe who have obviously very strong connections to Europe. People who live in America or in Asia who can have family connections, um, cultural connections. So Europe is really very much, for me, um, a, a personal experience, an environment, and constant discovery, constant discovery, because even if um, I was told in school and in university that the European project is a beautiful thing and, uh, and we built it uh, and uh, we will develop it, um, I was very ignorant of how other people in Europe, as a, as a French person, 
uh, but I believe it's true also for uh, uh, an English person and often for a Dutch person or a Spanish person. There is a lot of ignorance uh, still today of the experiences of other, uh, other Europeans uh, in other regions. And of course, we still have the legacy of the division of Europe, uh, uh, which was, I think, um, uh, like an amputation, actually. Um, we were amputated uh, of something. We were, something was stolen from us. And you, you, maybe you know uh, um, Milan Kundera's um, uh, text, uh, the, Ch the Czech writer from, I think, 1983. And, he, he, his text is titled The Kidnapped Europe, and he was talking about Central and, and Eastern Europe, the kidnapped Europe during the Cold War. Um, and now this expression has often been used, the return to Europe. It was used for Central and Eastern Europe uh, after the end of the Cold War. So they were promised, they wanted, the Poles, the Czechs, the Hungarians, they wanted the return to Europe. Um, um, but often in Western Europe, we were talking about the enlargement of the European uh, Union, the enlargement, not, not the return of uh, some lost cousins, but the enlargement of our entity. So there are these interesting psychological moments. Um, and so I, I, it would be interesting uh, to, to, to hear your thoughts on is, is Ukraine going to be uh, having a return to Europe? Does that sound right? I don't know. Uh, or is it the European Union that would enlarge to, to Ukraine? And that doesn't quite sound right either. Um, and I guess I, I, um, I uh, wanted to share maybe just two or three very simple thoughts. Um, one is that um, there, there have always been very many, many different narratives about Europe, about the European project. Um, there was the narrative of the founders. Uh, um, we speak of the founding fathers of the European project. Uh, like the Americans had the founding fathers, you know. Uh, uh, but we also, in Europe, uh, we have this narrative about the, the founding fathers, so Jean Monnet, uh, Adenauer, uh, de Gasperi in, in Italy, and um, uh, that's one narrative. But there, there are also other narratives which are less romantic, less romantic, but perhaps more realistic, and more uh, pragmatic, certainly. Um, and they have to do with not so much the notion of we came out of the Second World War, it was, it, everybody was devastated and uh, we saw the light and the light was about reconciliation and work together. That's the romantic narrative. The more pragmatic narrative is um, at the end of the Second World War, uh, the Americans had, uh, I think, three million soldiers in Europe, I, uh, several million soldiers in Europe. And um, it was not possible for them to keep these soldiers in Europe for, forever. So they had a strategic interest in making sure that our, the, the continent, the western part of the continent certainly, would be uh, stable uh, with a normal economy uh, and that they would not need to spend so many resources in making sure that there was not war in Europe again. And to pull out their troops, they needed to have a policy to, to help stabilize this, this continent or that part of the continent. And this uh, coincided with um, uh, some French needs. Uh, the French needed to reconstruct, they needed to rebuild their economy, but they needed some um, raw materials like coal, and that coal was uh, found in Germany, in the Saar region, in the Ruhr region. And the French were extremely uh, angry and with a lot of hatred against the Germans after the war. Um, I felt this even when I was a child uh, in, the, in the 70s, that there was still a lot of uh, resentment, a very big um, 
hostility, in fact, uh, to in families. I mean, in normal, you know, among normal people, not the leaders, not the political leaders. They would never say this, but among normal people, there was a lot of resentment for the occupation, for what happened, for the French defeat, you know, uh, and then, of course, liberation. Um, and the French uh, leaders at the time had uh, an ambition that maybe it would be the best, the best thing would be to completely dismantle Germany, to completely cut it into, you know, uh, different bits and pieces, and that the French would be able to take some control of some parts of Western Germany where there were raw materials that the French needed for their reconstruction. Now, um, the, um, the Americans were not interested in this, and the Soviets were not interested in this. Um, the Americans felt that it was not good for German de economic development if it was cut into little bits. Um, and they thought that the best thing to stabilize Germany was to have you know, a Western Germany that's, that's uh, in one piece, more or less. Um, the Dutch and the Belgians um, did not like the idea of the Americans leaving Europe. They, they wanted the Americans to stay in Europe. But uh, they, they, they didn't have, uh, you know, um, the, let's say the leverage to, make, to force that. And they were very aware that um, they also needed the market of Germany, that they were exporting, they needed to be able to export some goods to Germany. So they also needed German economy to, 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 to return. Anyway, so this, this equation is, is not something that I um, uh, was taught at school. It's something that I read as often in uh, non-French historians, and this, this is something that, for example, the historian Tony Judd has written about in a book published in 96 called Europe, the Grand Illusion and Question Mark. Um, he was a little bit critical of the European project, but he certainly was not romantic about the, the, the European project, and he made me see how there were some very concrete interests, very concrete economic needs that were at the beginning of the project, because the project starts with um, the coal and steel community, which, which is uh, founded in 1950. So this year, that's the real beginning, 1950, the coal and steel community, France and Germany bring together their coal industry and their steel industry. Um, and it's, so it's 73 years ago uh, this year. That's the beginning of the project. And what Tony Judd uh, interestingly describes is that the narrative, that was not the public narrative, right? At the time it was, we're going to reconcile and uh, uh, we, are, we have risen about, uh, we have risen above national hatreds, uh, we are good, you know, we're being good. Um, but he says that um, the narrative moved towards uh, uh, a retrospective narrative, meaning that as the decades passed, there were more treaties. You know, it starts with coal and steel, then it's more like economic, uh, co customs union, uh, the economic community, and then fast forward to 1992, which is a very important year. In 1992, it becomes a political union, political union, and that's the Treaty of Maastricht. And there, the narrative becomes much more political. The, but it's a narrative, and the narrative says from the beginning, we wanted a political union. From the very beginning, and now we are, we have, we're building it, which is not quite true. And then vocabulary is interesting. Um, uh, vocabulary is interesting. Uh, maybe you have seen in some comments on the European Union that it is about building an ever closer union, an ever closer union. This expression, ever closer union, um, made many people in the United Kingdom, where I lived during Brexit, many people were very nervous about this. Ever closer union, that means we will all become just one European nation, we will forget about our specific identity, that's scary, we don't want that, we don't want this federalism that brings us all into one Un unidentified, un indeterminate, uh, strange mixture. 
Um, but the text of the treaty, the, tr the text of the actual text of the of the um, European treaties says it does not it does not say an ever closer union of states. It doesn't say it's going to merge states. It says an ever closer union of peoples. So it's really, uh, the, the philosophy is really about contacts between people, people. And um, uh, Jean Monnet, who was one of the founding fathers, um, once said towards the end of his life, he said, um, if I had to start all over again, if I had to start from scratch, I would have started with culture, not with coal, steel, you know, economic things, but with culture, cultural interaction, cultural knowledge of each other, cultural understanding of differences. So the narratives have always changed, and I think they will continue to change. And I think Ukraine will change the European Union as it, as it uh, comes towards in it, and I think the European Union will change also as it, uh, as it accepts, as it integrates, as it uh, builds something new with Ukraine. I don't know when, how long that will take, but we know the process is, is underway because last year in, uh, in June, I believe, the promise was made, the decision was made that uh, Ukraine and Moldova would have uh, candidate status. And that's, that starts a process. But I believe the process, I, my instinct is that the process for Ukraine will be different than the process for previous enlargements, you know, for Poland, Hungary, uh, etc., uh, the Czechs and, um, and the Baltic states. Um, so the narratives have changed, um, and then the, very often, very often there are stereotypes uh, and, uh, attached to the European project, um, uh, and they're full of contradictions, they're full of paradoxes. So you have one stereotype says the European uh, Union is, is an overpowering bureaucratic monster, you know, it's, uh, it's a bureaucratic monster. Uh, and we must be, we must be, protect ourselves from it. Uh, I've, I heard this a lot in, in, uh, in Britain, before Brexit and since, and I, I, you, I hear it a lot also among some voices uh, in, in France, you can hear it also in Germany, mostly to the far right, but not only. So this, this uh, stereotype exists, and it's about something that's very powerful and very scary and very bureaucratic. And the other, the other uh, stereotype is the European Union is um, powerless, it's inefficient, it never produces results, it's always late, it's, it doesn't have uh, the tools, it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that. And that's another stereotype which is all about something that's messy, uh, disorganized, uh, inefficient. And so those two stereotypes are completely, there's a big contradiction between them, but they do, they do co coexist. Um, and, um, and it's interesting to spot them, you know, to kind of identify how they, how they can exist in different uh, discourses, political or intellectual. Um, um, and, um, what it is, if I, if I had to say what, if I had to say, in my view anyway, what, what it is, um, um, it, it's actually, I, I see it as a mechanism um, to uh, make, to help countries uh, that have in, generally in their long history, have had very complex relations between themselves. And I'm talking also, for example, countries in, in the Scandinavia area. They've also had very complex relations between themselves, histories. Uh, countries who have antagonistic histories, who sometimes have, you know, imperial grievances, um, um, who um, don't know each other very well, um, who have experienced trauma, uh, who can be very inward looking. It's a mechanism that helps all these different countries with all their differences and often hostilities um, 
to um, overcome disputes and to cooperate. It's a mechanism for producing compromise between people who don't always very, very much like each other and who don't always very, find it easy to work together. But this is the mechanism they have to, to work together and try to find solutions for everybody. Um, solutions that, that make sense for, for, the, for, the, for the family, you know, for the... Uh, I remember discussing this with Sophia recently and she said, well, it's like a, 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 an owner's co... A, it's like a co-owner's... the co-owners of a building, right? You have different mm -hmm. apartments. Just depending what you like, you can say it's communal co <laughs> condominium. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, depending on your taste. So, yeah. So you have a building with lots of different apartments and you have to treat some common problems like repairing the staircase, uh, you know, etc. And you have to have a dialogue between all the neighbors and they don't always, they're not always friends, they don't need to be friends, but they have this mechanism. So I, I, I see it that way. Um, and uh, another a last point uh, going back to the narratives is that um, I, I was looking through some notes and I've, uh, that I had taken a few years ago and I found some notes. Um, I was in a conference and the former German president, uh, Joachim Gauck, was speaking. Um, and he's, uh, he's uh, somebody I, I admire quite a lot. He's a, he was a former dissident in, from East Germany and he worked a lot on the archives of the Stasi. He was managing the opening of the archives of the Stasi. Uh, so he had, he's been some, one of the intellectuals who think about the totalitarian legacy. And uh, he said, it's, it's, it's really fascinating how in Europe we're constantly, we're constantly looking for narratives all the time. You know, we're always asking ourselves, what's the next narrative? It's, there's one chorus, it's like a chorus of voices saying, we need a new narrative. We need a new narrative for Europe. And I, I, by the way, I was in Brussels not long ago, and I heard from many people working in the institutions, we need a new narrative. We need to explain better what we do, and we need to be able to communicate better with people because they don't understand what we do. We need a new narrative. And Gauck was saying, um, uh, narratives are fine, you know, they're fine, but they have to be felt. They have to. It's. They can't be just words. They. They have to be felt. There has to be some kind of emotion there. And and this is very very tricky. Very tricky. You know. What is the emotion that brings us together? Once. Um, and uh, when you go to Brussels and you you visit, if you if you visit one day the, or if you have been there, the institution, the Brussels institution, the building of the Commission the European Ca the Council um, and other institutions, the External Action Service, which is the name of like the Foreign Ministry of Europe. You go to this place in Brussels, it's called uh, Rond Point Schumann, it's a uh, roundabout uh, with different buildings, and it looks very, there's no emotion there. There's, there's, it, it's just like, you know, administrative buildings. There's, they don't have much history. There are no historical, symbols, there's no culture, not at that place. And uh, it's always been a mystery to me why, why it's like this. But I guess they, they had some reasons for that, maybe to pull out the historical and the... Yes, and, and, but anyway, so Gauck said we, we, must, we must always remember that we, we need the emotions. And I, I think that what has happened with, with Ukraine uh, and since uh, since Maidan, but I would even say before, um, I was I was in Ukraine in 2004 during the Orange Revolution. Uh, I think that Ukraine, along uh, Ukraine, especially since this war, has brought an emotion to the question of Europe, to the narrative of Europe. Um, and I, I see this when I traveled last year across different European countries. I saw, I saw messages of solidarity for Ukraine. I saw Ukrainian flags with European flags. U U European flags have been shown in Ukraine. And I think Ukraine is bringing this emotion that Europe has been lacking. And I... Uh, uh, in these tra in these tragic circumstances, you are doing something which is 
you're bringing Europe an emotion that will, I think, uh, help help it help Europe, all of us, uh, because we're all Europeans, help us find not just the narrative but the reality, build the realities that 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 uh, you know can be can be can fit a, a nice narrative. That's. But um, I'm very happy to be here, and um, I, I, I would be delighted. I mean, we're, I know we're going to discuss among ourselves, but um, uh, it would be it would be wonderful if, if you could come in also with your comments and questions. That would be fantastic. Uh, I, will, I will add some comments, and maybe it's not necessary for you to transfer it or something. And I think this is a very um, general notion in, in Ukraine about European bureaucracy and about this being too slow and there is a lot of bitterness towards big European institutions, the UN uh, in general, not the European institution obviously, but some of them being too slow responding to our every second of pain and I'm not sure how how can we connect these two stances, this reality of European bureaucracy, whatever that means, and maybe it is more humane, human than we think, but there is this, I think, very bitter image of uh, too slow, but still I think narratives, narrative could be very um, vertical, and they are, someone writes it, someone creates it, but I think in fact, it, they write themselves, in a way. And this is also one of the favorite things in Ukraine to do, to write a narrative, but it's called, mm -hmm. not, uh, here it's not called the narrative, but it's called a strategy. Everyone writes the strategy, and it's like, so it's a completely compromised process to write a strategy, because they don't work and they are not efficient. And, but I think what, what you're talking about, the reconciliation, it actually works. So maybe somehow it, we should, we could and we are criticizing the narrative because it was different from the, from the reality in these economic and financial things. But still at the end it is also about reconciliation and about, I don't know, dialogue is also a very compromised no, uh, word now, but about some conversation. And I think maybe it's also an illusion, but since last year, since 24th of February, this dialogue between the European Union, whatever that is, <laughs> like the formal thing, yes, and Ukraine became more equal. Mm -hmm. We gained more subjectivity and agency, mm -hmm. and it met understanding in the EU, also with the flow of people who came, because these are very different people who brought their expertise, their professionalism, their, ex their experiences, their, their stories, and also our, some things, I don't know, there is a Polish guia, we, we're going, <laughs> we're going, yeah, so we will know the problems with the next application of guia, but still, it's like, um, I, th I feel this is one of these meeting points. And, um, and also, what, what, I, what, I, what, what I also wanted to maybe emphasize and try to think about what is in Ukraine, what is the difference between these narratives and how do we perceive it, because I think it's the other pile of, I don't know, concepts and understandings and misunderstandings. And maybe Sophia, you, if you if you want to kind of unfold this from the historical perspective, and from following the public discourse and how it has been unfolding for years about Europe and about our integration, I it's because I think it's a very mutual process. Yeah, I'll join this conversation um, probably. Um, mm. As a historian who studied, who studied amputated part <laughs> of Europe, yeah, and I actually explained some of my thinking that I would bring into this conversation, and I think that you know, like 
uh, reacting to what you said and thoughts uh, that I had have with that. Um, I think about the subjectivity, and also what Dasha just, just, just said, it, I think it's also the paradox, that we do have a couple of times for the paradox. Uh, we do have a very, for me, interesting, like fascinating thing to, to think of two simultaneous happenings. We have, so Ukraine is gaining subjectivity politically and gets economically adapted like hell. You know, just each month, it's that, you know, some funds are coming like grants, but actually not all of them coming like grants. We do not know what will happen. That's a whole different story we will tackle later, whatever later you know, you see. But, but actually thinking about it together, like, so you, how it can be that at the same time you have economic dependency, mm -hmm. indebtedness, which is di like this subjective in it. Eh? And then you have political subjectivity. So I think what it actually, I can't solve this conundrum, not political, eh? later. Historians come smart later. But I think it actually forces us to think about the nature or the possibility of power. So what is subjectivity as power? From what it can be built? So what are the ingredients? And I think this, this, this conundrum, this paradox, is not interesting for the relation between EU and uh, Ukraine. And to that we can come later, but also generally globally. Because, you know, we do have limited number of rich countries. Most countries are not rich. So, and if you frame power in economic terms, we live in a very unjust world. And you start thinking of power in a different way, that it can have different components. And we know that it does. You know, there's symbolic power, political power, there's a power of, of, a, of imagination, of, uh, you know, ideas. And, you know, I think that this is a bigger conversation, but so I would like to hang this here without knowing where. But like, um, and, uh, and about imagination, because we are talking to the words. Say so the words, I don't like return, actually, I mean, in this context, we talked in a couple of projects, we use the word return, return, but neither enlargement nor return. I think that, you know, they do, it does seem like problematic because they kind of, the way how they place the center. So, and I say that certain things are wrong or certain things are there. And I kind of, you know, they do not really, and I think that they do not accommodate in a good, these words, you know, this um, the partnership. So return meaning that you lost something, that you were in the wrong place. <laughs> Um, and then it just gives, it's not, yeah, so it's kind of all really the differences with all the... Um, what do you think of the word reunification? It's also like kind of, yeah, I just don't know. I mean, it says that there was this moment that they were united. I don't know when it was. It's again, you know, we can create, I think, but I think that there is a word which probably is not think, it's not helping for defining the the bureaucratic, but I think it is about imagining future, and it's very scary. I think the 20th century actually we came out of the Second World War with a number of things, and one of the things was actually the, um, the fear to imagine future radically. But a couple of times the future was imagined radically, it ended up with wars, with revolution, and with a lot of blood. So this was... You know, that this is where, and it's a kind, you know, this is the way that let's manage the future, like, cautiously. Like, let's not go, let's not dream wild, because the times we dreamed as societies wild, the price was high. So, and that's, you actually can see the post, post, last post-war European Union, but to part the transformation of Soviet Union. As a kind of let's let's not dream wild, let's kind of move slower. You know, choose words which are rather bureaucratic. Let's not do avant-garde, and we are in the avant-garde now, and the future is unclear. And this 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 is, you know, what will be the future beyond EU? You know, EU us 
world. It's a kind of, you know, how to utter this. And I think that this is really, it's not only about envisioning, it was also like overcoming the, one of the many things we are overcoming now of the, you know, how not to make wars. There's a lot of, and how to, yeah, for Germany, how to get weapons <coughs> to the East and, the, and so on and all of that. But one, I think also a big thing that how to dream and because we, the, you know, the times we dreamt before, it was, you know, it was, uh, it had, um, you know, it had consequences. And and I think that you know how to be bold in that, and it is scary, I think, and that how to. Uh, so and that is also it's a part of emotions, you know, because uh, and I think that this is, but it's a so that's coming to you to the. Um, emotions are uh, we do like, as a narratives we do need them but this is this is they are very they're very easy to get to, to be derailed mm -hmm. and you know i think also it's matters when when the moment you say and you, know, you say that ukrainians you know ukrainians bring emotions to mm -hmm. european union i thought and you know do we have to bleed more so that you mm -hmm. feel more <laughs> it's a kind of how much it's like a sense of you know, uh, is a kind of also stereotypical that you know there is a place where reason lives and there is a place that's in the world where emotions mm -hmm. live, and these are places not equal. Mm -hmm. They kind of you know we have this enlightenment, we are part of the enlightenment imagination that reason is higher, emotions are lower, and then you can you know you can follow that. Um, so, but you know, a little bit, I mean, just but narratives. And here, historians, narrative telling stories. A couple of thoughts that I have, not a couple of the questions, rather, I don't know. So, as a historian, so the past is told again and again. And we have these versions because from the today. So, each time, you know, we see different things, we notice different <coughs> things, we see different things relevant for the moment in which we are telling, the, I mean, the story. So if to imagine, and let's, I think, you know, you know, put that this is what will happen, that, that, EU, that Ukraine becomes a member of EU. So it's not entirely integration because, and I'm just looking at, at, at my colleague Natalia, with whom we couple, you know, had a couple of conversations about this word integration, a whole different context about, you know, the city of Lviv and, you know, this integration of people who are displaced. It's never, you never have integration. Is a, it's not that you have something which is stable and somebody moving. It's a change on both sides. Whether we are talking about, mm -hmm. you know, people coming to leave, the Libyans are changing, people coming to leave the city, everything is changing. So actually, you, you know, we will be changing together as we start. So, but how the history of EU will be changing? So what we will do with the fathers? <laughs> what we will do with the, I mean, I'm kind of, you know, what we will do with the, I mean, this is a story, so there is this legal history of EU, a British, and we're kind of, you know, coming to that party late, we will, get, we will have an agreement, so we will have an agreement at some, you know, we already have a couple of agreements, so there's a little bit to build on, but not from the very beginning, so, so how you can, um, you know, rethink, and I just do not know, I'm not, I'm not a historian of EU, I'm a historian of post-war, and I'm just thinking, like, you know, maybe it's about, you know, one of the direction actually to think about EU in Cold War context. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's 1950, what happens in the 1950? 1950, you know, Cold War is rolling. Mm -hmm. And the recent scholarship, recent in history and science means like 15, 10 to 15 years, is that Cold War is, old, is a story of, um, um, it's a conflict, it's of superpowers fighting each other in different ways, not always cold, as we know, mm. but it's also a story of entanglement, of different ways. It's a story of competition, it's a story of looking at each other. And I think that, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, if you think about European Union and see, you know, how, I don't know, let's, I'm just now switching the, the, the focus and say, 
Uh, we know that housing is a big deal after the war. So it's, you know, Soviet unions looking at the France, how they're constructing a couple of things there, doing this prefabrication. And then EU, not EU as EU, but last looks like, you know, uh, hey, you know, they're doing all the social things, we don't do like them, but what we do in the market socially. Mm -hmm. So the role of literacy, you know, there's more of the materiality appropriation, you know, films, scripts, um, you know, like stealing the design or appropriating the design of, you know, of refrigerators. You know, did we know that? You know, the stories of the vinyl and jeans uh, and cloth. But there is also this immaterial moving in the other direction. So saying from socialism to the other parts. Mm -hmm. And this entanglement, I don't know whether it could be something that one could see uh, mm -hmm. as a possible retelling or like, like not retelling the story if you but expanding it a little bit. Another one is actually this, the comparative story of reconstruction, you know, the war, you know, how Europe got to the war. It's not only EU story of getting how actually, you know, then, then EU is bigger, how it can accommodate these experiences which are happening not within EU and how you can and you know how there is this new European Bauhaus should we trace it to Weimar can we do like a little bit more of intellectual legacies uh, you know thinking around um, and and I think that finally moving more closer uh, more into the 90s when we still don't have like these big agreements with EU there is not from bureaucratic, there is EU and uh, from below, the labor migration from the 90s on, from many, many people mm -hmm. who moved from Ukraine and not only to work in European Union countries. Is it a moment then, you know, politics, geopolitics, high culture can actually not, can have a look at this relation. So, and here, I think it was before COVID, I was uh, flying from Naples to, uh, yeah, before COVID, from Naples to Lviv, direct flight. There's a reason, but there is a the, the flight, the direct flight between Naples and Lviv. And there was a whole class of Italian kids going to Lviv. You know, not as, for example, kids are going from French school to Pompeii. So maybe actually, so, and I think what, what they're doing, you know, how, I mean, but they were, so they thought, okay, you know, probably there are kids and, you know, who, whose parents or mother is Ukrainian. And, uh, and I think this is also the moment of also thinking about EU, not only as bureaucratic, but not only as cultural elites project or economic elites, but actually movement of people, because it is movement and a part of, EU story is not only legal movement of people, but illegal. And that's a question of the legality, which it has problems. You know, not all legality is good legality. <laughs> you sometimes have to change it. Uh, so, so it's like from below. So I think that, you know, like following stories of, um, of people. And then I think that that's probably for this, uh, and, and Maybe it's other for a couple of ideas later. Let's. Do you want to comment on that? Something? Um, thank you so much for, uh, this is such a rich conversation and um, uh, I'm sure you're, you're going to come in with your questions, but everything, everything that you've said, um, it just um, makes, you know, I'm, I'm a journalist. I worked 30 years in, in journalism. And it makes me um, really think that we're we're actually only we're only at the beginning of this conversation, and I think we're perhaps at the beginning of a, a real European conversation. Maybe not the production of a perfect narrative. I don't believe in one perfect narrative, but I do believe in a conversation that is uh, full of like a like a polyphonic, you know. Uh, different tones, different voices, different sensitivities, and I, I think that conversation uh, is still ahead of us. And as a journalist and somebody who worked in, who has worked in the media, I, uh, I, always, I always feel this deep frustration that we don't, we don't have, uh, we don't have a, a media or 
uh, a space that would be the place where we would have this cross-European conversation, including you know people in this country. Of course, there's a language, but there's a language question. But I don't think it's that difficult with new technologies. And I always, I, I've been thinking a lot about this, and it's it's a hard. Um, it's like the Rubik's, Rubik's Cube, you know, you try to find the solution, and I, I, I haven't found it, but it, I think it's the, it's, it's, it will be beautiful when we find the solution to this Rubik's Cube of having a space, a digital space, but also in-person networks, and even more of them, that help us have this, this uh, cross-European conversation. And last, last, last little comment, um, uh, in uh, 20, in 21, I was uh, on um, I was on a, a, a fellowship based in Berlin, and they made us go for a trip, and we went to the border with Luxembourg, Germany, Luxembourg, and France. And it was towards the end of the COVID. It was after the COVID lockdowns, and when you when you go to the border of uh, Luxembourg, Germany, and France you're at the heart of the free movement system. It's Schengen, you're, you're in the Schengen, this is where Schengen was uh, first uh, invented, you know, the, the Schengen is nearby, and, um, and it was just after the, the COVID lockdowns, and we were speaking to people on different sides of the border, who live in villages or in the cities there, and they were saying, it was it was it was terrible during during COVID. Um, the border was closed. You know, the border was closed, and we were, uh, and in particular, the German side had closed the border, so the, the French uh, couldn't go into Germany, and the Germans anyway. And the but the German side closed the border because they were scared of COVID coming from eastern France. There was a cluster of COVID in Mulhouse in Alsace where I, I spent some years in my childhood anyway. And, and so the first reflex in, uh, you know, uh, so many decades after the beginning of the European project was to close the border. Um, and that's, I, I remember, uh, of course, it was, it was uh, sad to hear that this was the reflex to close the border, you know. Um, but um, what was interesting was that people, it, it awakened people to the importance of how important it was to them that the border stay, stay open. And this, <laughs> this, this was a moment of emotion for them, in the, you know, and, and it, but the emotion, the interest of emotion is that it brings an awareness, you know, it suddenly brings an awareness that actually it's important that this border is open and that we, we, we don't have this old reflex of closing the border. We don't, the other side is a threat. We don't know what's going on on the other side. No, you keep the border open. And I, um, I, think, that's, I think that's very important. You, 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 need, you need laws, you need rules. Uh, Europe is not a no border area. Europe has borders. But uh, when you have a system of free movement, it's very important that it that it's uh, that is that it is protected because it has such deep psychological um, consequences. Okay, before before we open the floor to the questions, I will throw in one more my my, my uh, thought about one thing and it's like cultural perspective because I'm from. from this is my background, and actually, I think it could be one of the um, one of the answers about why these bureaucratic Brussels uh, Brussels buildings on this roundabout are so neutral, are so gray. Because I think, and I think this this particular war taught us, and maybe showed us, and actually not, not this war, but also some processes that are being un unfolding, have been unfolding for a long time, like Me Too and Red Lives Matter and these decolonial things, but not the decolonial that we are talking about, but the real decolonial thing. So my point is that maybe this neutrality is caused by the, by the stance that actually the, the cultural conversation, the conversation about culture is the most difficult conversation. Because I think we should, we need to rethink the notion of culture, 
we need to, to rethink our fascination with it and our idealization of it, especially I don't know, France, for example, which like, culture and art is divine, of a divine nature, and artists cannot be wrong. I think this is the stance that is very uh, popular and very powerful in, in Western Europe. And I think that for the, we, we've been witnessing that for the, for the last years that this stance has been compromised and culture is much more complex and much more, I don't know, sinful, wrong also, and toxic. And I think this neutral architecture could be like the subconscious um, avoidance of this culture, because you, otherwise you will, you will end uh, quarreling about whose influences should be like French, or Italian, or Austrian, or someone. So it's, no one wants to go there because it's at the same time it's protection of the culture and opening the culture. There's so many paradoxes in talking about culture. It's so difficult. And at the end, I think this is like the, the conversation that also has started. And I think this is super complex. And this is where we, this is where we could drown, but we, we shouldn't. We should keep, keep, keep together and be horizontal and be um, listening to each other. But I think this is like what you said, the culture should be the starting point. Mm -hmm. But it's not because it is so open and so, also because, because it, it could, it, it has all the instruments, but now we've seen that these instruments were used for wrong things, injustice, and what we're witnessing, for example, is also a result of a culture, of some way. So yes, I think this is like one of the one of my recent reflections. So now I think we can open uh, open up for your reflections and, and questions. And I think if 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 you're comfortable uh, to Ask, uh, ask in Ukrainian, there is a English, it should be in English, so this is your headphone, if anything. So please, and I think there is, yeah, there is a mic in the, in the room, so please, yeah. Thank you uh, for this conversation, thank you for your introductory remark about the funding of the European Union, actually, it's, it was very interesting because you mentioned about this uh, initial stage of the European Union as a union of coal and steel and here in Ukraine probably one of the most popular narrative that it exists at the moment is the narrative that Ukrainians want to join the European Union because of the values, not because of the steel and coal, but I think it's rather a hypocritic narrative because uh, we all know that actually the metaphorical steel and coal is very important and uh, the reason why uh, Ukrainians want to join the European Union but uh, so it was very interesting remark to hear uh, but in general I wanted to ask about emotions because you mentioned that uh, what Ukrainians bring to European Europeans currently is uh, something that was lacking and uh, it is emotions so now I'm curious, what kind of emotions are those? What exactly are those emotions in, in your view? Is it, I don't know, fear? Is it, uh, I don't know, sympathy, empathy? Is it, uh, I don't know, what, what kind of emotions in your view uh, is uh, uh, something that is unilateral for, for all European Union citizens when it comes to um, the, the war in Ukraine in Ukraine in general. Thank you. Um, I think it's absolutely normal and uh, I, I wouldn't uh, imagine it otherwise that if uh, Ukraine uh, wants to uh, uh, be, be part of the construct which is the European Union, it's not just because of the values there, it's also because of, you know, very straightforward, concrete uh, 
economic and other advantages and, and benefits, and that's absolutely normal. And by the way, all the other uh, countries that joined the European, the European project over the years since it was created, they all did it for the same reason. You know? I mean, the British decided to join in 1973 because it was in their economic interest to join. It wasn't because they needed you know, to show that they had democratic values or they needed to join a democratic club. They were already, you know, fully established, one of the oldest, you know, the, if not the oldest democracy. So uh, every country that joined, joined because it, it looked at what its interests were, uh, how it can benefit from being part of, the, of this uh, entity, um, and uh, also because it's, it was increasingly strange to be outside of it. You know, it was increasingly odd, a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit, you know. And the, another reason is, uh, and here I'm quoting, uh, there is uh, one of the founding fathers, he, he was Belgian, and his name was Paul-Henri Spack, and he once said, actually, Europe is built of two categories of countries. Um, categories who uh, countries who are small and who know they are small, and countries who are small but who don't know that they are small. <laughs> and uh, and what that means, what that means is, uh, it's on your own. You you don't weigh that much. You 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 can you can get less things done in your interest. So really, it's it's that co-property thing, you know. Um, um, and about the, about the emotions today, and it's um, it's it's a very good qu question, and um, I want to um, I want to give you an answer which can only be my personal. You know, it's it's not scientific. I haven't read uh, deep uh, sociological uh, studies of this or opinion polls, but it's a very good question, um, and I I will. Um, I will tell you about, uh, I hope briefly, because sometimes I speak too long, but I, to, it was maybe in April last year, I, um, I visited the mother of a friend, and she's, qu she's quite old, this friend is older, and she is in her um, late 80s, early 90s, she lives in the suburb of Paris, and she lived all her life in France, um, worked um, in some small shop all her life, brought up two, two, two sons, and is obviously retired. And she, like many, um, like many elderly people, she spends a lot of time watching television, and she's a little bit ill, and she's at home. And I visited her, um, and uh, I was with her son, so my friend uh, Frédéric, and she, she started telling us things that she had never told to her, her own son, which were memories of 1940 in France, when the Nazis had invaded, invaded France. Uh, they came, to, they came to, to Paris, and she was uh, a young girl, and she had never told her own son this, this uh, story. Um, because she, she had pushed it to the back of her head, but she was watching the images of uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian uh, cities being bombed and families being on the road and having to flee. And this brought back um, her story, which was that she, with her parents and her older daughters, or her older uh, sisters, sorry, they had to. They lived in a poor neighborhood of Paris, and they had to uh, put their things on a cart. You know, with a with, with a cart that you push with wheels, and they walked uh, maybe you know uh, 100 kilometers, even more, to the south towards the Loire River. And she remembered this. She was giving. This was pouring out of her. She was describing this. And I, I want to mention this because I believe that uh, the first emotion that, that, uh, uh, that uh, was shared in different places and by different people is the, um, is the reawakening of the trauma of big war, you know, big war. And um, uh, that's, that's something. And, uh, um, it, there was, there has been incredible shock, incredible um, uh, 
horror at what has happened uh, to, to Ukraine since the 24th of February. And there has been, of course, a little bit more awareness of what was going on since 2014. But uh, the, the shock, the horror, um, the, tr the awakening of deep traumas, because this is a, Europe is a continent of traumas, and we're in a part of Europe where there are many traumas, but there are other traumas elsewhere in Europe. Um, you go to Spain and people will tell you about the traumas of the Civil War, of the Franco regime. Uh, so these emotions are very deep, and we are a part of the world where there's many, many traumas, many emotions. So these, this was reawakened. There is a lot of empathy for Ukrainians. Um, uh, it's, not, it's not just uh, political blah blah, it's true. I, I've seen it in, uh, I've seen it in, uh, in, in Belgium, uh, you know, I've seen it in the provinces in France, I've seen it in, uh, in the UK. Uh, in, uh, in Sweden, there's, there's a lot of empathy. Um, people are really shocked and really want to sh for solidarity to happen, for help to come. Uh, and then you have the political level, which is, you know, political levels are uh, a mixture of um, political calculus, uh, intro strategic interests, capacity to work together or not. But overall, if I had to say one thing about the political level in Europe, uh, it is that nobody, nobody uh, has any doubts that um, the, um, the uh, need to have uh, a good, a positive outcome of this tragedy, to, that, that is a positive outcome for Ukraine, is not just something that is morally right, it is something that is in all our interests, all our strategic interests. Um, now, how you formulate, how you define that outcome is, is, a, is, a, is a difficult question, but there's little doubt that um, uh, everybody has a stake in, in, uh, in Ukraine's future. It's, it's not just the Ukrainians on their own, it's, it's everybody has a stake. Now, it doesn't mean that we're, getting, we're going to get it all right. We're, it doesn't mean we're not making mistakes. It doesn't mean we, the reactions weren't slow or insufficient. Or, but there is a perception, and it's also an emotion, that we have a stake. There, there's something at play. There's something that is um, uh, at stake, you know, uh, that, is, that matters to all of us across the continent. And that's, that's, you know, if you think about that, and if you think of the relative indifference to Ukraine, uh, relative indifference, you know, in, the, in different periods, in the last 30 years, it's, uh, it's like almost a mental revolution, you know. Um, so I, I think it's very important that solidarity and concrete solidarity continues. Um, and, and, then, and then just one sentence. It's actually a triangle, you know. It's it's Ukraine, it's the Europeans, and it's the Americans. Because we we live in we live in that world, and I think that's uh, also a good thing. That the, what the Americans will do, will do and decide is very important for um, what will happen uh, on the continent. Just like in the 20th century, uh, that's that's the reality we are in, and this. This little reality, this big reality, actually, is something that triggers emotions also. Uh, an emotion? <laughs> I can't get emotion. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for this interesting conversation. Um, I also love your idea about the emotion. Uh, I think it triggered a lot of people in the audience. But I'm wondering because I think that maybe it's the same emotion that Europe was trying to get previously from Russia. But now it appears to be that Ukraine is the source of that emotion. I think that Europe was in love with Russia as with something irrational, something romantic, something romantic something that brings this emotion which contradicts this by bureaucracy and something very um, uh, boring. Uh, so what happens now with Russia? 
if Ukraine is an ocean, Russia is what? Fear, ugliness, something terrifying. So what's, what, what's there? Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to be brief, and these are very good questions. Um, I, um, Ukraine is not just emotion. It is emotion. But it's strategic interest. Really, keep those two thoughts. It's strategic interest for everybody now. Um, on, um, on, on, the, on and another little thought, the bureaucracy. I'm, I'm the first one to say it looks like a bureaucratic you know, machine when I go to Brussels. But one small thing, um, there are fewer people working in the European bureaucracy. It's around 30,000 people. Every, all the European institutions together, the Parliament, the Commission, the Council of Europe, the External Action Service, maybe 30, 35,000 people at maximum. Uh, and the Paris uh, uh, Town Hall and all the agencies that depend on it, there are more people working for it. So, you know, in the, the bureaucra bureaucracy of the Paris city municipality is bigger than the European uh, institutions. So, actually, it's, it's bureaucratic. Uh, I think we understand what that means, but it's actually not very big. You know, it's not a big bureaucracy. This, be careful because that narrative, we've, we've heard it many, many times because it was part of the Brexit narrative. And the Brexit narrative s spread across all our media, all our information space. But um, um, Russia, um, uh, let, me, um, let me maybe um, uh, um, allow me to correct one, one thing that you said, that Europe was in love with Russia. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I th um, but I, I think some, some politicians had romantic, abstract ideas of Russia. Um, but I don't think Europe was in love with Russia. I think Europe, um, in the early 90s and uh, up until maybe the late 2000s, but um, had hopes which many of them were unrealistic and based on a lot of um, wishful thinking, had hopes that Russia would be different, would become different, would move in the right direction. Many had these hopes. Um, I also think that there, is a lot, there was a lot of ignorance uh, about, about, there is a lot of ignorance about Russia. Um, uh, many people pretend to be experts on Russia. Um, it's like a, it's a very common trade now. You know, you can make a lot of money being an expert on Russia. But um, uh, and the other thing is, I think in fact um, there was a lot of indifference to Russia and to what it was doing also and to what it was becoming. And there was a lot of indifference, especially after 9-11. 2001, the terrorist attacks against the USA. I remember this moment when the attention on what Russia is doing, what, is it, what it is becoming. And this coincides almost with you know, Putin building his system. You know, 2001, he's in the Kremlin, starting to build his system. And at that moment, the attention of the West, the attention of many Europeans, moves away from, from Russia and the nature of the political system that uh, Putin and his uh, circle have built. Um, and this is something that uh, everybody has paid a high, is paying a high price for. Uh, I think the Ukraine is obviously paying a, 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 you know, the huge, 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 huge biggest price. But it's actually a price, uh, it's actually something that everybody now is realizing was, was a big mistake and that there was an, a mistake in uh, evaluating what Russia was becoming and what it was, uh, what was the nature of the political system, the ideological or polit nature, criminal ideological nature of it. Um, and last thing on the supposed, you know, love or popularity. Actually, when even uh, 
actually when you look at opinion polls, and I remember looking at them even even before the war, this invasion, I, I remember looking at opinion polls of uh, Russia or Putin's ratings in different uh, countries in the West. They were very low. There was never, there was never uh, any love actually. There, there were more like uninformed or wishful thinking, you know, uninformed hopes or wishful thinking and indifference. That, that's what, that, would be my, that would be my um, answer. And a little bit about this love or not love. And I think this feeling manifests a lot in cultural decisions, in arts, in selections. That's why we feel it. And I, I think that as, as a person who tries to write about it, think about it, I think this is, it comes with the notion that culture is sacred, that artist is, artist, artistic figure is sacred and cannot be wrong. Do you hear me? I cannot be wrong. Whatever he's doing. And the third thing is laziness. I think it's like an intellectual laziness, unfortunately, of the big institutions who provide then the policies, customary they come, I don't know, even Berlinale who tries a lot, I don't know, Venice Film Festival, I'm talking about film people sign from, from the film background, but also many more fields. I think it's laziness and also um, not daring to question the status quo, not daring to question the hierarchies of culture that had been existing for many years to revise the canon, whatever it is, and also not the resistance to dream big, because I think dreaming big results in revising these power structures, and everyone is a bit afraid of that, because, I don't know, for example, just about TV Fimo will lose his job, so, or something like that, yes, because, because, because this power shift, because the power shift needed it's so strong that all these people who gain from it actually are going to lose a lot and there is a lot of at stake and culture is very um, how they um, is, is the, culture, culture culture is a vanity fair and russia played a lot with this vanity and maybe that's why we have this this feeling. So yeah, but this is also like a bit of question whether you know whether you want to like, rethink the landscape and these hierarchies in cultural you know, and that's um, and and it's for big institutions, but it's also you know, what do we see beyond that? You know, it's also there is this injustice that institutions that play internationally are. You know, the way they are, you know, they, 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 they commercially, it's an issue of you know, box office and, uh, and kind of here yeah, thinking that they are beyond politics but they, it's very much a political thing. On the other hand, you know, it's just also that culture can be in places that we, we don't go <laughs> and it's a question to ask why you don't go there. You know? And uh, mm, that's about like, you know, like really I think that thinking about from below, it's not that we you know that this is below in this hierarchy of the discussion. Finding another, you know, another type of where that culture can happen, where actual politics also can happen. It's not about the, saying that this is not where we go. It's just there are many ways of. I mean, recently we're thinking about like the twinning city. Yeah. So this is so um, like previous post-war came with this idea of twinning cities. So we know that, and uh, this is like part of reaction that big politics failed. And looking at how can one establish connection between, um, you know, between societies and countries, which is not about political elite, not because not, not to capital cities, not to big institutions, but between different institutions. Yeah. So that comes the city to city thing. 
Um, and this is also something that, you know, a couple of you know, discussions came, like, you know, and how we, one can actually think about different, and it is already there, they're, they're building on that, thinking that of different levels and layers, and not even levels and multiple because it's a hierarchical again, we kind of have different options, there are more options than we see. Yeah. Yeah, and that's... And you, just to go back to, um, you asked, what is Russia now for, for Europeans? And, um, and this, this makes me think of something Sophia was mentioning, that the European project, the European concept, I mean, uh, construct was a Cold War, a Cold War project, and it's true. It was, it, it was built also because there was the Cold War, and we needed to consolidate these countries uh, in the West uh, facing the Soviet Union. And uh, what happened after 89, 91, is that for, you know, two decades, two decades and a, and a half, uh, People uh, kind of forgot about this this reality that had existed before that there was a, a, a real threat from the from the east, you know, which was the Soviet Union, and um, what what this war, the the invasion, um, has uh, uh, done in the perception of Russia is really now uh, a return to the notion that the European construct is also something that uh, uh, is, is a, an entity that is resisting, you know, pushing back, uh, opposing the enemy which Russia has become. Russia today is perceived as an enemy, actually, by policymakers in Europe. They may not say it uh, exactly in those words, but that's really that's really how the, it's perceived because now people are, you know, taking measures for uh, protection against what Russia is capable of doing, and and you know, and and the fact that Ukraine has is resisting this and uh, is is a huge thing. It's it's something that remember nobody was expecting it. Remember in, uh, in on February twenty four. Not many people in Western Europe, in America, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, I don't know, here, I don't know, but not, not everybody was convinced that Ukraine was going to be able to resist this attack. So this, this is, um, and that, that goes to, to Dasha's comment that there's, it's true that, it's true that this very resistance creates a kind of equality, a, a, le a level, a level playing field between Ukraine and the Europeans. Because let's face it, you know, um, uh, it, without this resistance, the Europeans would have uh, probably, probably uh, accommodated a situation where Ukraine was occupied, invaded by Russia. That's, I'm, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm, I'm, I'm a journalist, that's my opinion. I think the sad truth is that if the Ukrainians had not resisted, the Europeans probably would not have started sending, you know, uh, tanks or whatever to free Ukraine. So uh, that's the historical moment we are in, and that's that's how important it is. But the Europeans are aware that Russia today is an enemy. Yeah. One hand, I think we can come to final question or comment. Thank you very much for such a wonderful discussion. Um, but sorry, I want to return to this emotion topic. Yes. Uh, but I want to talk about the future a little yes. bit because uh, all the emotion Ukraine is source, yeah, source of the emotion connected with the invasion and with the war. But the war will end sooner or later. We hope it will end with our victory. So what kind of emotion we can bring to the European Union after? And what else besides the emotion we can also contribute to the European Union, to your opinion? It's the first question. And the second one may be very general, but about the role of the United Kingdom. What kind of the European Union will have or will have now, 
without the United yet. Thank you. Um, if you have any thoughts on this, uh, um, I think my, my, my answer to, the, to your very difficult question about trying to anticipate you know, what after, what's after victory, after the war. I think it will be um, an extremely powerful emotion, but not just emotion. There is strategic interest, which will be there very, very much. But if I had to talk about the emotion, I would say it would be the emotion which comes from the fact that you, you see that people who uh, um, all could have, were, were in danger of losing their freedom, people who were in danger of losing their freedom gained it, defended it, and won it. And that is a very powerful emotion. You know, you were, you were in danger of losing your freedom, which is just about everything, right? And you, and so I think that emotion uh, into uh, all that dry, arid bureaucracy, purely economic, you know, customs union, uh, that, that the fight for a people's freedom and the victory and the defending of that freedom is a very powerful emotion. Um, and it's not just an emotion, it's about values, it's about, anyway, it's... Uh, um, and about, about the United Kingdom, now, uh, in, I, I was in London when the, they voted Brexit, um, and uh, I, you know, it, it, um, I, to this day, I, I, I will I, all my life I will regret this vote. Uh, I, I, um, but I think um, I think that uh, it's uh, so. I think it's a terrible loss. I think it's a terrible loss for the European Union. I think it's also a loss for the British. But it's really a big loss for the European Union. Let's not. Uh, pretend that, oh, we can just continue, it doesn't matter. No, no, it's a huge loss. It's a very important country. Um, um, in many ways, very important in many, many ways. Um, and so I think that uh, if uh, people are thinking about not just emotions, but also strategic interests, um, then everything has to be done for the for the United Kingdom to be as, as close as possible to the rest of the Europeans. They are still Europeans in, in their ge ge geography, identity, etc. Um, so I think one challenge we will have is to make sure that uh, we find um, as many ways as possible to be close, to do some things with them, to do maybe very important things. Um, and uh, I, th I think um, there are many people in, 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 in the United Kingdom who, who also want that. You know, now it's, uh, it's going to be, in June, it's going to be seven years after the vote of Brexit. And I think a lot of people have been thinking also about, uh, yeah, seven years, yeah. It's crazy. Um, um, so, uh, I, and I believe, I, I, I believe that I will see the day when we can all be together again, you know, with, with the British. And, and uh, yeah, I, I think I will see that day. <laughs> Before or after Ukraine? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. The faster the better for both. Um. If you want to make some closing comments or reflections or maybe post some questions for us to, to think uh, on our wind holes or to the face or somewhere. Closing? I think it was a good question to go home with you. What can, you know, what, what can we take? What can we bring? You know, and it's also very empowering because it's like, you know, it is something where you know, partnership comes. You take, you break, you change. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's change. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming.